Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, all right. Good energy today. I like it. I like it. So, uh, it, you know, we're, we keep on running through the machine learning section, right? Uh, if you remember on Monday, we talked about regression, right? Oh, okay. And before that, we were talking about decision trees. And so we're mostly sticking in this area, right, for our sake. Um, we'll, we're going to essentially stay in the kind of supervised learning or uh, supervised learning area of machine learning. The principal component analysis was really our, our kind of dip into the unsupervised. But that's where 422, as you're all now clawing and fighting for your you know, classes for next semester, right? You know, 422 could be your, your next step in the, in the AI sort of world because again, it's like, oh, okay, well, moving into the next category. But like I was saying, so what we're talking about today, again, is this idea of natural language processing. And because, you know, if you look at our timeline, we don't have much time left, right? So we have essentially uh, neural networks and then generative AI, right? So uh, where I'm kind of going with these few, you know, these lectures towards this end is, a, again, still teaching you the material, but also trying to like build up a nice little kind of foundation for then let's talk about like how J chat GPT works, right? That's, that's ultimately where I'm trying to get at. And that does come back into this idea of natural language processing. Because you notice, right, if you think about what we ended up doing in decision trees, right? We utilized structured data. We, we came in and we were saying, hey, you know, I have a label. And given my attributes, let me predict from that label, right? That was the decision tree. But then I sort of came by and with PCA, right, principal component analysis, I said, we're not using sort of CSV files. We're not using tables right we're using a face suddenly and it was pixels it was you know xy coordinates on a three uh, on a two dimensional plane and what i like to kind of think about with that is we're now talking about different types of data right again text files, but really this is just CSV files full of numbers, uh, potentially. This is X, Y coordinates on a two-dimensional plane. Notice specifically the similarity. A number, even though we could use like a discrete state as that number. Points, you know, continuous value. So in essence, This is where we go with natural language processing, is this fact that, hey, I got a sentence. How do I treat it the same way that I was able to with PCA that I was with the decision tree? How can I utilize some sort of mathematical equation on text? And that's essentially where we get into this entire process, right? It's not just about the structure, but again, can we start utilizing it in some way? So again, we've talked about this uh, before. It, so it's not that I'm going to like very quickly go over it, but also not uh, at the same time. Again, uh, the idea becomes, all right, let's arbitrarily say we want to use machine learning, right, on robo-texting. We all know, you know, especially after, uh, uh, I think, it, it, when did it really start? We, Robocalling started really like picking up what, right before COVID or during COVID? None of us remember because we didn't answer the phone. We just saw an unknown number and went, no. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I can't remember. But anyways, more to my point is like we all sort of noticed it happen. Like the robocall rise happened, and then that quelled down, and suddenly the robo text started appearing. And those are still happening. They're okay. All right. Think about that. That's now modern robo texting is a little harder, but we'll actually talk about that towards the end of this. Right. Let's start with the easy stuff. The spam. The, the, the genuine spam ones, you look at it, you know very clearly one of these is not spam. One of them is very clearly spam. Which one is very clearly spam? Yes, obvious, right? Uh, so we all see that. And so why I present that, and notice I made this very vague of like which one is most obviously spam. Why? Why is that one spam? No one talks like that. No one talk. I've seen what y'all Gen Alpha and Zoomers talk like. Skibbity Toilet Ohio Phantom Tax. Right? Okay, so that ain't, that ain't, that don't work no more. I get, no, you're, you are right. <laughs> uh, so, okay. I hope I just didn't like say the, did I say all the words right? That's the important part. Oh, I got canceled. <laughs> Story of my life. Anyways, right? If we're looking at this, what do you mean people don't talk like this? So kind of expand. Like, not really. Like, this is like Matrix, Star Wars, those aren't really related. And like, I don't know, I guess they're kind of related to the movie stuff, but it doesn't really like, no one would just be like, here, right, here's the thing for free. Ah, okay, so now we're getting somewhere because, you know, this is where I could, I, I'm doing a little pushback because you'll see why it's hard, right? You know, once upon a time at least, you did kind of ask your friends to go out to the movies, right? This was before the COVID and we, and it, you know, movies were also $80, we, we stopped. But my point being is like, oh, here's the movies that are out right now, which one do you want? So I could see lists of movies happening. Right, but you you are starting to kind of bring in some extra points. This idea that it's free. What other reasons you would look at this and say that that's very clearly a a spam message? Right. Tries to redirect you somewhere else, take you to another location. Uh, that's uh, another one that you hear oftentimes is uh, the the sense of a sense of urgency. Uh, so it's redirecting you to a different location, but also specifically, it's not here, but this like, hey, you need to get this now type of thing. That's where explanations are coming in. I don't expect any texts, but my family really likes to show me pictures. I get what you mean too. Like, so yes, you're all right, right? You're not, it's not that you're wrong. Uh, that's called crowd work. Uh, no. <laughs> right? The idea is that something about this, and we all see it, especially because we've lived it long enough, can look at that right one and go, that is a spam message. I know Alan, uh, or I don't know Alan, doesn't matter, right? I, I know that that is a spam message. And so this actually kind of, you know, we'll, we'll veer into this a little bit, but this is a very interesting uh, 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 point that a uh, former CEO of Reddit uh, went to Twitter and uh, talked about. Unfortunately, uh, I'm not logging into my Twitter, uh, so you click on the link and you log into your Twitter and get your ads. My point being is specifically, though, what he was talking about was this idea that trying to moderate online speech is incredibly difficult. Now, specifically, they're, oh, excuse me, they're talking about it from uh, this idea of uh, what, what, they were talking about it mostly from just like trying to stop spam, because robo texting and calling, and this is when we really started talking about bots on the internet, um, or like it becoming a, a common thing to talk about. But the big issue is, right, there's multiple things that, we start thinking about from a content moderation standpoint, not just a spam standpoint. Like, how do you combat spam? Non-controversial topics, controversial ones, right? Misinformation, uh, hate speech, all those things, right? Whatever term you want to kind of work off of, how do you 
decide when to block something, right? How do you decide to block a spam message from happening? Because I know the technology to do it. Would you like me to spam you right now? No, because I will be arrested. It, we actually made it law. You can't do it, right? So either way, right, this is where we get into this idea that we are still kind of going to work off of the, the table, the structure text table for this. But you know very much, right, it's not just the label, but notice it's just essentially text. It's a string format. You know how to represent a string in programs. And so what if I happen to have all of these data points that are here's a spam message, here is not a spam message, or ham in this case, right? Well, again, if we're thinking about this from the process of I want to build some type of AI model that can look at this input and then say, you know, definitively, right? Again, if we're looking at this, we see this first one, spam or ham? Probably ham. Probably ham. Right? We look at this one, spam or ham. <laughs> right? Very clearly, we see that this one follows the same characteristics of our spam message. And so how, we, how do we start? Like, how do we even begin this whole thing? Because I said it's just a string, but you know what that means. It's one giant list of characters that have no relation whatsoever to each other. That's not a thing in computer science, right? We, we taught you that in CS1. So what do I got to do? Well, this is where we have to do a whole lot of data pre-processing. Because if you've listened to me for more than like five seconds, you realize I just say a lot of stuff that I probably don't need to. It's a lot of fluff going on there. You could probably peck down a lot of it. But that same thing is going on with our sentences. There's a lot of excess. There's a lot of fluff that, unfortunately, makes it incredibly difficult to just immediately send it to any you know, machine learning algorithm. First one is we got punctuations. Once again, remember, think about strings for a second. <sighs> If I did a dot split, you know, uh, with spacing on all of my strings, and then I'm doing like a comparison of clear, right? This this string that's five letters. Well, what happens when I do a dot comparison with clear with a comma? What's it resolve to? False, right? They are not the same. You've built many of these dot equal methods by the time you got here, right? that becomes a problem, right? Because they are not the same. Uh-oh, okay, well that becomes major issues as you can start to see anytime we have a punctuation that causes issues. The same thing happens with the word inflections, right? Instead of it's clear, it's that's with an apostrophe versus that or that's without the apostrophe, ain't with an apostrophe, without the apostrophe, right? All the yours, your, yours, right? And then capitalization. All of those elements are becoming sort of our first problems of everything. And you could think, oh, okay, well, you know, we could do some techniques. We could do some tricks along the way. And yes, that's exact. Welcome to data pre-processing. Here are those tricks that we need to start to kind of worry about or handle. So, oh, so this is uh, uh, before we jump into the steps. This is another one, right? So capitalization, big problem. Another problem is, oh, well, remember, right? You've noticed that when we are talking about decision trees, we are essentially dealing with probability, right? And then when we were talking about PCA, it wasn't necessarily probability, but we were still using statistics. So we were still looking for things that are, you know, dependent on each other or influence each other. The problem is stop words are fluff, right? Again, this was what I was saying. A lot of what I say 
is just excess. Me saying the letter, the word is, right? We, as people, need that. It helps build context. But the problem is, it's such a common word for us that when I look at these two sentences, uh-oh, there's, right, these things are super frequent. But they don't really give me any explanation of what's in the message is really the point I'm trying to get at, right? Having the letter or having the word for, having the word is or to or with, those are not important words. Those have, those are going to appear everywhere. And so again, I don't necessarily need them. So what do I start to do? Now we're starting to get into the process and we call this step normalizing text. And so again, the entire idea is the first thing that you would want to do, right? Maybe first time, you know, this, this is, does, it depends, right? But you would take your message Break it in. Break it down into just the individual parts, right? So you do a split. You, you're separating. Notice suddenly it's not just one giant string. It's a sequence of string character or a sequence of strings, right? Good so far? Haven't blown your mind with literally just one line of code? Good. Now, you notice as we're setting up these tokens, I'm not necessarily always doing string. This is where it gets a little more funky, right? You, you would also be splitting on things like apostrophes, or you do a little bit extra to this, right? Um, so you can see doesn't becomes does not, right? And not in its kind of more, you know, generic sense, not generics, in its, what is this called again? Contractional? phase, right? We remove it from being a contraction of does, you know, doesn't into does not, but in its contraction form. That's still a part of the process. Again, it's not just a one-liner type of thing. You are looking through this. Uh, once upon a time, we, we gave this as an assignment to you in 316. Uh, it was hilarious when I gave it to you. My point being, right? The idea is, so what we're essentially trying to do is change it from one string into an array of strings, a collection of strings. Because then what do I do? Okay, well, the problem is that I didn't really address the fact that I'm still dealing with sort of, um, right, here's a good one, being, right? Being is the present tense for be right, to be. But the issue is, right, again, that same thing that we saw of dot equals. Being dot equals B, true or false? False, right? That's a major issue because, again, we do want them to be true. We do want to look at these individual terms, and even if it's not the exact spelling, we do want you to know it is similar enough, right? And how do we start to go about that? It's not just we do a comparison on the words, but what we attempt to do is we attempt to create a root word, right? Again, let's look at all the different tenses. That can be formed from B, right? Being, been, is there another one? Am. Huh? Am. 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 Yeah, sure. You know what? I'll actually take that one. Yeah. So we got a lot of words that are very similar, right? Being, been, and specifically, this is why I liked, uh, you know, using the am, Right. Being, oh, well, this one has ing at the end. This one has been at the end. We're going to leave this one for a second because, again, what we end up doing 
is we are attempting to do something called stemification. Stemification is this entire idea that, uh, again, there's a whole slew. I'm not going to do the whole thing because you can see it's a lot. Uh, but again, right, essentially what you end up doing to the words, whatever the word happens to be, there's tons of rules in the stemification process, right? Uh, if you're just doing stripping of the suffix, right, if it ends in an ED, it doesn't matter, right, if that word still needs the ED. It's right, hey, dot ends with ED, okay, dot replace, get rid of the ED. Uh, ING, remove it. Lee, remove it. Like, that becomes a process. And again, what this is going to do is this is going to start to form uh, what we would call a root word, right? Um, so you notice, uh, where is it? So if we look to, say, for example, <laughs> right here, sarcastic, right? Well, even though sarcastic, or even though sarcast is not a word, that part we don't necessarily care about, right? We're trying to get rid of, like, every instance of the ick or sarcastically, right? We're trying to get rid of all of that as well from it. Again, because now what we should, we're hoping for, fingers crossed, right, is we have something where every instance of the, every kind of version or form of the word now is going to be the same thing. Where's that being that we are dealing with? Being has been trimmed and processed into be, right? I've handled it. Or did I? Right? Now, granted, before I jump to it, because I know what the... You notice, I'm not getting rid of numbers. And I'm not getting rid of words that end with numbers either. Why? Because that is still technically relevant. Don't treat it like English. Treat it like it's a collection of words and we're trying to find the similarities of words. So matrix three uh, actually starts getting into something we call named entity recognition, right? We know that that is trying to reference a movie, right? We get that that's a movie. The computer doesn't know it's a movie. It knows it's a string, right? What's the difference between a movie and a word, right? That's a yes, open question, right? So again, we don't necessarily drop those numbers off them because they may have some kind of uh, relevance to what we're seeing, right? But that was one approach, right? Stemification or stematization. Now we've got a better approach, a more robust approach because, once again, I'm dealing with the fact that am, right, I'm not, those, B and am don't connect, right? And so that becomes a bit of an issue. And so what we end up doing is if we had stematization, right, converting everything into its stem form, there's another version known as limitization, converting it into its lemma. All that means is, again, it's this tr attempt to try and find the root word. And I and notice, again, it's much more of like, I'm just sort of throwing these out here. Yes, this is open work. This is the where, you know, these are the pain points of current, you know, natural language processing. We're still trying to do it, right? So it will see that words that do have a very similar super close to uh, uh, objective, will connect with each other, right? Um, being, right, it, we no longer are just, we're not chopping off letters. We would do full-on replacements. So if I saw, let me, if I saw the word be, or I saw the word been, or if I saw the word am, Again, what I end up doing is instead of changing the string by cutting off letters and removing them, I just swap them entirely. I, I literally do a full-on swap. Let me see if there's a, another one in there. Uh, about me, want, want to live. Okay, here's a better, right? 
some other things that systematization are, are going to do is you can see like, hey, you know, the, this is, the word was why, right? But because it ended with a Y, the rules of, uh, of stemming say change Ys to Is, right? Lemmas, they're not rules. It's literally, hey, you're, you're talking the word Y. So keep the root word uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, now, it does kind of change. You, you see the S's in does is not getting removed on either side, right? Yes, right? It, it, if, what are these root words? It's a great question. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Uh, I don't know all of them, <laughs> right? Uh, so, again, that's the big thing is either way, what we're trying to do is, once again, go through and reduce these down into their, their basic parts, right? Good so far? Now, that was essentially, uh, um, what is, that was essentially the starting point. Remember, I started talking about how, oh, punctuation was an issue, inflections were an issue. So we've essentially taken care of that part of it, but we never dealt with the stop words. The stop words are too excessive, and the problem is we're about to do math on this entire set. Well, I have something that's overly frequent and not, Im, not going to impact the end calculations, right? It's too frequent, uh, especially since we're going to be dealing with probability. I'll go ahead and give you the this, this spoiler there. Since we're dealing with probability, right, that becomes a big issue, is, hey, the word is is super frequent and highly probable to appear in everything. But you can see what I end up doing, right? If we looked at, I think I'm using the, the lemma here. Again, this is what that string looked like initially. Uh, now, if I removed all those stop words, notice how much less is there. Now, granted, you see that uh, the spam version Still has a lot, but that's that's not really the part that matters. It's not like, oh, spam messages don't have these things. That's not really the case, right? But you can see that we've trimmed down. We've trimmed a lot of the fat of that message that had things that didn't matter into them. Notice does is gone, right? That whole does not, right? Does is just completely gone. But not stayed. Why? Because not's a negation, and that's kind of important, right, uh, in, all, in those kinds of worlds. So we're left with some part of the message. Good so far? Good. So now what? So again, the big issue here is, remember, we're, we're at the end of the day, this needs to be done with a calculation, a.k.a. it's a computer, right? And the problem with that is, right, just remember, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I have an n equaling 12. What happens when n becomes 12,000, 12 million, 12 billion, right? Again, your for loops start taking time. So this whole dropping the stop words part is our attempt to maintain the most relevant part of the sentence and kind of that's our attempt at optimizing the algorithm. Get rid of things that, again, are statistically insignificant because it just removed an operation that you had to worry about. Then what? Well, typically, this is typically. I will skip, oh, I'm not going to skip over this, but like I'm, I'm just going to like mention, again, it's at the end of the day, those are all strings. The problem is that we're dealing with mathematical models. So we have to build mathematical models for them. And so this is where you transform them from uh, strings into some type of vector or number, right? Oh, let me swap this word now with some digit, right? That, that's essentially where that comes into play. I'm not going to keep it this way, mostly because... That doesn't, you know, from an artist standpoint, that, that, you know, I don't like it. But assume all my things are numbers as soon as I hit the next arrow, okay? Look at those numbers, right? 
So again, if we're looking at it, let's say, for example, bless you. <laughs> if we're looking at a message, now the process becomes, okay, here is that message. Is this a spam message? So what happens? Well, I take my string, and then I start doing the conversions. Now, this is where I'm giving some of this as like uh, more handing, handing you states. Where are you? There you are. Right. Open NLP, you have full access to this. This is also Java, I think. So like, yeah, oh yeah, look at that. You, there's your favorite words right there, right? So if you're feeling froggy, you know, dictionary, right? Import this, start building your own chat GPTs. Just don't use them in class. No, don't. <laughs> right, my point being, either way, right, again, I've converted it into... I've done all the data pre-processing. Now it's time to do the prediction part. So again, how do we do that, right? Okay, well, what's the probability that those letters are spam? And then what's the probability that those letters or those words are not spam? Which one of them was bigger? Ta-da, right? Which one has the higher probability of being true? So. That is exactly what we end up doing, right? Now, what is the probability of spam given that I have observed these words as my evidence, right? That's essentially where we're starting to go with natural language processing is this idea of, again, we're playing probability with this. Now, I'm not going to make you do this math, right? Because what is the probability of spam given these words? I don't... That gets into a, a whole ugly mess. We'll, we'll actually dig into it in just a second. But this is where, all right, you know, how do you design that out of picking it, right? Maybe you do something where it's just a simple kind of do a comparison, right? Or you could do a confidence threshold, right? That's an, another thing where it's like, hey, just look at the probability of this message. If it's a high enough probability, put it into the spam folder. Right? Now I'm thinking email, uh, so to speak, right? Don't delete it, don't block it, don't hide it. Just move it into the spam folder, right? Because it may still not be spam. We don't know. I'm just going to, you know, keep it away for a little bit. So that's now where we start getting into the classification process, right? And specifically, I'll introduce to you something known as naive bays. Now, I'm not showing you naive Bayes right now. I'm showing you conditional independence, right? This was a calculation you just did. You're all good with this. You're very familiar with this, right? Oh, what is the thing given the thing? Welcome to Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is slightly different. Reason why I did it is you notice it's represented the same way, right? That left hand is doing the same thing, but they are two different formulas altogether, right? So specifically on this version, right, the idea becomes, hey, what is the probability of A given that I have observed B? Well, what that is going to equal is the probability of B given A times just the probability of A existing entirely, right, over the probability of B you know, again, this being uh, my observation, right? So again, what we're thinking here is A and B should be independent. And therefore, if they're independent, these values should be different, right? We cannot say that there's any independent or uh, dependence between the words quite yet. So what that model starts to look like, right, is well, what is the probability that the message is spam? given this is the message. Well, translating that into Bayes' theorem becomes, well, what is the likelihood that that message appears in our spam collection, right? Because we have a data set known, of, known as spam. What's the probability these words appear in that section? All, all five of those words, five, four, five. What's the probability all five of those words appear in spam? What's the probability of spam alone? Right? What's the probability that those, word, how, uh, those words are common in both 
are spam and ham. Yeah. Given a, would you have to use the conditional independence like the normal one? Because otherwise you'd be doing. We're not doing conditional independence anymore at all. Okay. Yeah. That I, I, the only reason I showed this slide is to remind you that this conditional independence uses the same symbols. That's it. We're not using it whatsoever. It is not conditional independence anymore. It is Bayes' theorem. Calculate the probability of being given A. If you don't know the probability of A. Well, so start reading it in a different light is what I'm trying to get at. It's no longer a single value, right? It's, think of this as a giant data set of now just like how, or yeah. I have a bunch of words. Some of those words are in my spam collection. Some of them are in my not spam collection. Just what's the probability that those words exist in my corpus of data, period, on both sides of it, in all my labels? What's the probability? And this is, specifically, this is not like a calculated value. It's you go in to your spam corpus uh, and say just, What's the probability that these words all are, are all in there? Yeah. So again, that's, it, it, it becomes much more of like how we represent this, right? Um, and then from there, right, as we continue to dig into this, this is why, like I, I said, I'm not giving it to you as a math equation because I'd have to, I'd have to give you a corpus of like, 200 megabytes of examples to really hammer in like that, that this is not spam. Uh, it's not something I can just like give you toy example from, sadly. Um, but that's where I, I did, kind of. I'm just not making it. Anyways, bam, okay. So now here's where at least we're going to throw out some of the caveats. Naive Bayes, assumes that each term is independent of each other, right? And uh, you see there's a star, you see that we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. I want you to just think about why that may not be a good idea. Don't, don't answer, I'll ask you in a little bit, but just why may that not be a good idea uh, to assume terms are independent? So again, as that's going in, right, we are going to start to flesh this out. This is suddenly becoming, right, I'm, I, I, I'm still, I still got this ugly math equation, and can I make this a little easier to myself? And so what we end up doing is, well, remember what we're kind of representing in our, our, our calculation, that big ugly formula that I'm showing, right, the probability, sorry, I'll call you later, given uh, a corpus of spam messages, right? What I'm essentially at asking you is, well, what is the probability that the word sorry appears in every single one of my spam messages? Times, what's the probability all appears in every single one of my spam messages? Times, what is the probability that call appears in all of my spam messages? So this is kind of like you go through every one of those messages you got in your data set, Hey, is call in it, right? You're doing your relative frequency. How likely is that word appearing in your spam messages, right? That, and then when you're doing it here, how likely is that sentence just appearing in all your messages? But you're going through, you're doing that same calculation over and over and over and over and over again, right? Good so far? How are we doing? What becomes a major problem? Huh? Not yet. Like if you have a negating term, it would be the opposite. No, no. Just look at the math equation. Don't you're you're adding English like the rules of English to this? Just look at the math. Keeping track of the probability. Oh, yeah, and what's going to happen if I have a bigger string or a bigger sentence? It's going to be 
not huge. It's going to be tiny, right? 50% chance this appeared, right? Times 10% chance this appeared, times 5%, times 45, times 75. All of those probabilities are going to get really teeny tiny. So again, that, that becomes a major issue. So what do I end up doing, right? This is Now this gets into like, sure, we can technically still do that math, right? There's nothing stopping us from doing that math except this thing. Why can't you just do infinitely small decimal numbers, computer? Because you didn't build me that way. Shut up, right? You figure it out. My point being, right, as I start multiplying really small numbers, it becomes a major issue from our perspective as computer scientists because that really small number has to get stored on something. And the problem is, right, how far do decimal places go in a programming language? Right? That is like stuff that we have to actually deal with. So as a consequence, what we end up doing is we are going to utilize essentially the fact that I am doing a series of probabilities, right? I am doing that, that product design, right? I am doing this part. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is instead, let me have a cutoff. Let me have it, have a, a, a law of diminishing return. So now my numbers, they're not going to get infinitely smaller there's going to be sort of a trade-off, a, a cutoff going on here because I'm wrapping it in log, right? That turns into, and this is where the log property comes in, right? This is going to shift the formula. Rather than doing multiplications, I can do the summation of the logs of those individual probabilities, right? Again, let's arbitrarily say I have a few numbers here, Python. Uh, do I need, I'm going to, okay, uh, import random as r, um, numbers will equal that, uh, for i in range 20, numbers dot append, uh, r dot random, numbers. So those are all my numbers, right? Just assume that these are probabilities of words, right? So if I were to then go in, um, total equals one for our mm, mm, num in numbers, uh, total times equal num, total. Look how tiny that word is, or that number is suddenly after doing all those multiplications, right? That's some absurdly small number to the negative five power. I know that that doesn't seem like much, that I'm only dealing with uh, 20 words here, right? So that's not a lot of words. Now, let's change that. Let's instead do a running total on the logs. So I gotta grab uh, math in here, right? So I go in and let's do that same for total plus equals m dot log uh, probability num. That's a much more manageable number, right? That is a number I could work with, is my point, right? That is the more important part there, is it is a number that is not super so tiny that right, I might have issues storing it on my processor. Negative 10, right? That's what we are doing here, right? Again, we have some absurdly small number that is zero or getting closer and closer to zero as I continue to multiply sub one numbers. Actual number that we all can look at and go, yep, that's a number, 
right? That's where what we're essentially doing is that, that log property is letting us cap. Again, think diminishing returns. It will level off at the end of the day. So once that comes into play, again, what we're looking for in the naive Bayes classification is we start running through. Well, what is the probability that those words appear in our spam or not spam data sets? What's the probability of our spam or not spam just in our data set, right? So again, just I have a list of words. How many of them are, are not spam? What's the probability that my data set is just not spam versus spam? And then what do I do after I've done these calculations? And, and, oh, that's, that was a, well, I got two numbers. You're, you're doing all the words but telling me, you know, a decision. You're, you're saying everything besides how to make the decision. How do I make the decision between my two numbers? Big and smaller. Whichever one of these is bigger, right? Because again, it's probability. So which one of these has the higher probability? The word is, or that message is in my spam section or the probability that that message is in my not spam section. Whichever one of those probabilities is the bigger probability, ta-da, right? That's your way, again, or you could go with the confidence threshold, right? But either one of those is going to work for you nicely. Questions? Yes? Oh, yeah, we also got the not word stuff going on there, too. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it helps kind of maintain that issue, because if we multiply it a, a zero, it, yeah. Uh, so, other questions? Yes. Probability be the probability of like spam given all those words on the left, or is that correct up there? Well, so again, remember the. Uh, I'm going to do this one that way. I don't have to stretch, right? What we're essentially saying is, well, what is the probability that? Um, how do I frame this? Right. So we're not looking at the original message anymore. We're almost trying to say, what is the probability um, these words exist in my corpus of not spam? So I have a giant list. Uh, I'm going to go, like, I have a giant list of word or uh, records. Some of them say spam, some of them say not spam. If I filtered specifically to, in my case, the not spam section, Right? What is the probability of these words existing in this not spam section? That's essentially now what we're getting at. Remember, this is getting all the way back to the Bayes theorem part of specifically our original approach, our, 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 our core kind of starting point to this calculation is what's the probability that it is a spam message given the message? Then that using Bayes' theorem is now we do some flipping of just like what's the probability? Let me jump back to this one. Right? What we're there. What is the probability something is spam given what it is? We're flipping that over. We're, we're going to rewrite the math equation into okay, well, how likely are these words in the spam section? How likely is spam in my section altogether? How likely are those words, period, like in the entire data set? Does that help? Using me is that in, on the other side, it has that P, sorry, I'll call you later, given spam, and then it also so we have that whole summation thing, and then it also multiplies it by 
log of the probability of spam. So it looks like it's including the top two parts of that. Oh, so if you, yeah, if you look at sort of this part, so it's, I'm not showing like the full math equations kind of thing. The, the more important, or not more important part, what I'm more getting at is like, oh, you know, you would be doing a log of just what's the probability of sorry plus the probability of I'll by itself. Like that's still your denominator. You'd still be calculating that part out. But notice it would be on both sides. Right, so you would have uh, on this part and this part, um, how, just the, the summation I1 of log P W1. And that same summation would be happening down here. So like just comparing which one is bigger, we don't necessarily need the calculator. Is that why it's not on there? No, no, I just didn't include it. For space purposes is more like, it, it's still happening, but it, you're essentially, uh, again, like, it's the ratio between them kind of thing, right? Um, the other kinds of things, uh, I'm trying to think. Again, what if I'm not doing a comparison between two separate labels? I'm doing a confidence measure. So in that case of like spam, I still need the denominator because I need to know just like of my entire data set, what's the probability that this is in the spam section of it. And then if that's over some confidence threshold, then get rid of it. Good, cool. Other questions? So at the end of the day, right, what's the pros and cons, right? Again, we did this. And in fact, Naive Bayes, this is how most of your spam uh, emails are caught. Now, I, I'm saying that with the caveat of I don't know what many of those companies are doing nowadays uh, just because I don't work for them and NDAs and all that stuff exists. But Naive Bayes is essentially that was the algorithm when they started building out mail servers, right? I need to deal with spam, right? Here's now me needing to have some form of filter for my mail server so that my employees are not being overwhelmed with spam messages. <laughs> Naive Bayes was the one that did it. Now, specifically, you can see, right, it's actually pretty straightforward. It's just probabilities, and yeah, you are, you know, the training for it's not actually that difficult. It's just doing one pass of what's the likelihood of each one of my tokens appearing in my data set or in my spam, not spam data set. That part's actually pretty fast uh, in the grand scheme of it, right? Um, but we get into some issues here. Works very well with discrete values, right? Words that get swapped out with numbers, but what happens if they're numbers with decimal points? So it has limitations. It has, and specifically why I mean that is like, as we start hitting you know, the barriers that have introduced us to the LLM space, right, we are seeing why we like, moved, you know, where a lot of these initial AI algorithms that we had, right, the advancement was because they were only working in discretes, right, whole numbers, and we needed continuous because now you've got a little bit extra, right? But there's one more that I don't have on here and I talked about. What's sort of that, that last issue uh, in regards to the calculation? It was something I had stated and then I said we'll come back to it. <laughs> Say that loud, so proud? And why is it kind of a, an issue? The order does make a difference. We're dealing with English, right? We're dealing with English. English has order, has context. Words matter. If I say does and then I say does not, 
right? It's not that those are two separate independent words that are not impacting each other. One is very clearly impacting the other, right? So this is a limitation to naive Bayes is what I'm trying to get. And it's a major one. And we all look at that and nod. And then we implement it anyway. That's right. That's the annoying part. It's like, yep, yep, right? If you don't like that, invent something that doesn't deal with it. And that, welcome to LLMs. Welcome to neural networks and all of the LSTMs, bio LSTMs, all of that stuff, right? It's because we, were, we, we realized that, hey, things are dependent on each other, right? But again, I also mentioned that this didn't really work on sentiment, or uh, uh, on, uh, it was good at classifying, but it wasn't really good on estimating. And so let's arbitrarily look at a sentence here, right? If you looked at this sentence, would you say that this sentence or this post on Reddit is a positive post or a negative post? Positive. positive. And you don't need to look it up. It's a fake post. <laughs> I see. It's just friends. Oh, I found Dr. G's Reddit. No, you didn't. <laughs> right? I know I'm conceited, but I'm not that conceited. <laughs> Uh, no, my point being is like this becomes an issue because, again, as we as humans have started to use the Internet and we, hey, can crawl the Internet, and wouldn't it be great if I had something that could tell me good sentiment because I want to build like an auto stock trader. And if I see articles that have negative sentiments, I know to sell. If I see positive sentiments, I know to buy. Or if I see that negative sentiments of a movie are appearing, oh, it bombed or it broke record, right? That's a big issue because it cannot. It doesn't know where to fall. And in fact, here's where uh, I, I, I am, I'm, sh I'm like hitting the ceiling, our current ceiling of AI, essentially. Many algorithms struggle with this. Yes, we have sentiment calculators. I am not going into them. But at the, at the same point, it's like this, not a, a lot of our algorithms do not handle this well. And in fact, as you start getting into sentiment, remember the concept of what sentiment is. It's human feelings. We're back into psychology land, and my goodness, have you met a human? <laughs> They're a piece of work, <laughs> right? Oh, so suddenly, you know, how do you recognize emotion through text? Should you? Uh, and then, in fact, uh, before I get to that, like, this is now where it's just like, what are we trying to do with this now, right? Okay, classifications, right? That's, you know, a very noble one. But I also started talking about this idea of sentiments, right? I'm starting to look at my text, and I'm starting to try and draw context from it. This is actually some really fun work as well, known as named entity recognition. And this is still modern stuff. Like, this is go get a doctorate, and this will be your work type of thing, right? Given this structure, right, given this text, like a medical journal, where are uh, the words? And then where are, you know, what, what does a word mean is essentially what I'm trying to get at, right? Medical conditions. We see a bunch of acronyms oftentimes. Why? You, you even see acronyms, right? You, you're computer people. TBI. Anyone know what TBI stands for? Yeah, traumatic brain injury, right? But if you're trying to do some form of stemming or lemming, right, you're making an assumption that the, the string that you were given was an English word, not an acronym. Suddenly, I'm giving you acronyms. And if you start pruning that, you've changed the meaning because it's, again, it's not a word. It's not a tense. It's a thing. Um, and so that becomes a major issue. DAI, diffuse axonal injury. Uh, so in that case, that's a type of uh, traumatic brain injury. But then you've also got things like ICUs and hospitals. Hospital is a word. But what I'm trying to also get at is what is a hospital? Right, that, that's the part I'm trying. It's not just that it is a word in English, 
It is a location in English, right? That's additional context that's starting to get added. We need that stuff, and we don't know how to apply it from a, I want you to kind of, this is where I want you to think about these things, like, right? This being a DII, medical condition, right? It, it's a, not only an acronym, but it's also representing of some thing, that thing being a medical uh, 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 condition. Hyperactivity, is that a condition? Um, <laughs> trying to see if we've got any more of them. Um, Right? I know the word diagnosed, we would prune and trim it, but then what is diagnosed? Right? That's where you got to dust off my uh, Jarofsky's uh, grammar to go, oh, that's a verb. Right? That's a location, that's a verb. And what kind of verb is it? Typically an investigative verb. Right? Those things right there, that is current modern what you would be dealing with research. And guess what? It's hard. But this is where I'll at least kind of give you some of the, the reason why you would want to do these types of things, right? So this is where uh, Dr. Colin Lynch here in the ARG lab, he was my advisor. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't do this stuff. I dealt with the education. But specifically, one of the things that he's looking to do is, hey, how do we uh, build better arguments? Right, and you know, I know that so many of you just are cheating and using ChatGPT to build your arguments for you. Not you know, the royal you, not any one of you specifically. I would never do that to anyone specifically. Right? I should have not looked at an actual person. I should have stared like into the the void. My point being, right? Well, again, okay. Well, what does it mean to make a good argument? Right, from an English standpoint, that's a great kind of question, right? Oh, well, you know, I may have um, some types of uh, uh, main claims that my argument is having. In this case, uh, some art or some museums and art galleries will not disappear. Uh, so the argument is, right, art isn't going away. Okay, can you justify that major claim, right? Okay, well, there are some smaller claims going on there. And notice it's not me labeling a word, it's me labeling a sentence or a fragment of the sentence. Again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify those things because if you can identify them, congratulations, you can model them. And if you can model them, does that model look like a tree? Because we have algorithms for trees, right? That's kind of where this is going into uh, Dr. Lynch's work. Um, also, specifically, uh, this is where uh, a colleague of mine, when, I, you know, when we were both in uh, the program, uh, they're currently at Google right now, I think doing something with the autocomplete. I don't know, you know, um, specifically, again. But the same kind of concept was going on here, right? Autocomplete. You write emails now in Google. Gmail, and you notice how it, it's, it's got the autocomplete functionality mm -hmm. suddenly appearing now? Well, again, right, how could I potentially have that be right? I have to have a way to do that. It's not uh, possible. And so what you could see is maybe, right, I might have the, some of these become tokens themselves. Rather than having two tokens, I believe, okay, what, can we convert that into a single token, condense it down? Because it's, uh, here's a, a good one. I believe it's only two, right? However, I know that I, as I write, if I have to cold call, cold email someone, I always end with, thank you for your time and considera consideration. <laughs> Notice how many letters I had, or words I had to write there, right? I had to write, uh, that's eight words in sign language, right? I had to write eight words. Again, what happens when I'm starting to multiply or do a, calculations? Eight words is eight operations. Can I shrink that down into one operation? 
save some time. And that's exactly what we ended up doing or uh, um, uh, what uh, Dr. Zhu did. Um, so again, now we just use that for autocomplete in our emails. Um, but this is now where I kind of open, this is not really meant to be like a, a discussion point because I'm not opening that can of worms this year. Y'all have your own opinions on these things. Um, but this is where, you know, I just showed you all the math that goes into trying to model and process text. Well, why do we do it? Oh, it would just stop spam messages like from hitting our, our emails and our phones. But this has been expanded because now we live in the era of social media and everyone's posting every thought that they've ever had on the internet. And so this becomes a major problem because people don't like each other, uh, period. But how do you try and classify some of the, the other issues? Like when I'm dealing with something like hate speech or false information or words that are, uh, uh, what is it? You can't say uh, certain words because they get censored automatically, right? Then you have to magically say the word unalive suddenly, right? That's a word you're all familiar with now, right? That, that one just got invented like in the last three or four years, right? It, it, Right? Why? Because saying the other one, right, putting it onto the internet, uh, whatever platform doesn't, you know, they, they are tracking for that. And if you do, right, then you're punished for whatever reason. So suddenly, hey, you know, how do you classify something uh, that's a little bit harder to deal with? Not just spam messages, but like, what is false information, right? Is that Bat Boy lives in West Virginia? Right? That's what bat, you know, that's what false information was when I was your age. Now we're dealing with like, are aliens real? <laughs> there was a hearing today about that. I don't I don't even want I'm not even gonna get it right. Uh, when we start getting into hate speech, same kind of problem goes in there because you know, instead of words, you can start using emojis. And that just opens up a giant can of a worm of like what emojis mean what? What does? I'm not even gonna draw things, right? <laughs> So how do you try and now automatically detect it, right? Okay, how do you classify something? That's easy, right? Okay, you get a student, you get a grad student or a bunch of undergrads, and you just start labeling and you come to an agreement and right, that's easy to do. But now how do you add that autonomy to this, right? How do you make this an automatic process? That's where we get into the gray areas of this stuff, right? How do you start to monitor and detect these things. Because again, you're still trying to classify them. Now you're trying to detect them automatically, even though the classifications may be skewed or difficult to do. And then I open up to the next question. Should you, right? Should you monitor? Should you automatically moderate? Should you uh, identify these types of uh, pieces of information and then actually try and you know, moderate that on your site. Yes, you're, you know, you signed up with terms of service, all that. And all. I'm looking at it from a math problem perspective. Like, it's a hard math problem that we don't know how to solve because English is weird. Um, and specifically, here's case in point, right? Oh, if I start to automate the process, uh, you know, I know it's for just a video game, so, you know, not terrible, but obviously the way I want you to think about that is, yeah, that's a video game, change it to Facebook. Right. Can I do the same thing on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok? And now what happens? Does it still happen? And so in this case, um, Blizzard with World of Warcraft actually has a major issue uh, where if you watch some videos or dig up uh, a lot of that conversation, specifically uh, since that has its own in-game economy, uh, anyone who doesn't like a com uh, you know, competition will mass report you. And Blizzard has, uh, again, I'm speaking mostly as just like someone who has never worked for Blizzard, but like the issue will be, hey, this account has now seen an uptick in reports. Well, a threshold got crossed and rather than have a person look at it, they do essentially lock the account, right? And then they flag it and someone now does have to manually review it. But what has happened is, well, since it got temporarily locked, right, 
Well, again, if I don't like somebody, let me just mass report them through a bunch of fake accounts and not let them be in the game anymore, right? So the same kind of process. You can probably do that now with any platform, right? I'm not, please do not now use this. Uh, I, I hate the fact that I'm now teaching you how to be evil on the internet. Um, don't. That's, that's the best I can do. Thank you. Thank you for the nod. Thank you. You have all signed your, your academic honor pledges to not be mean on the internet. My point being, right, that's a major issue. So how would you fix it? Can you fix it, right? How do you, right? It's, it, that's an, a, 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 a real-world instance of both, like, weaponization of, you know, AI, but also in that sense of, like, false information, right? If it's just your math reporting someone for not doing, you know, for, because you don't like them, right? You're, you're essentially, uh, you know, putting a target on their back for no reason type of things. Um, the last little bit I'll get to and I'll, I'll finish up is if you are feeling uh, like you want to start digging into this stuff, again, it's not that it's out of reach. It's right at your, your fingertips. So you can go in. There's your mavens and gradles and there's your, you know, jar files or whatever they are. Uh, and then it's just where there you are. There's your tutorials and books on just like how to do this stuff. Uh, and that's essentially the next step. Is there something out there in the world that you are like, I would really like to mine? I would really like to mine all of the Project Gutenberg uh, papers, or papers, uh, books, and build my own chat GPTs and whatnot, right? That's how, they, that's how they started, is they had to do NLP to get the data. So again, it's all out there, uh, so have fun with it. Um, but if there are, are there any questions since I, I'm now just sort of rambling? Let me, let me kind of go that way. Yes. Yes. So it would be, so the, the question was when I'm doing the naive Bayes part, Specifically, I'm showing words. Assume that they're numbers. I just didn't show numbers here because I wanted to really kind of have that effect of like the word of like, here's where those words are kind of sitting in them. The word sorry given I'm in the ham or the sp not spam stuff. Um, but no, they are still treated like numbers in your code kind of territory. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. So when you typically when you're converting it, um, so that's where you are based on your database. Now, with in mind, typically what you're you're really doing is you're grabbing some form of uh, you're working off of some library, right? I showed you Open NLP because you're not building these things yourself. You're you're grabbing the library. Um, Another one, uh, NLTK, Python. All right, uh, this is a very common one as well. Uh, and so almost one of the first things you're doing is you're doing that tokenization process, right? Just here's my you know, library, here's my sentence, immediately start tokenizing it. That's not done. Um, uh, what's that? I, I see where I am on time. I'll try and finish it up. Uh, um, in Python, with Python. I think that's, where's the thing? I don't have it anymore. Oh, goodness. It's an old, uh, show me the XKCD comic. Show me the XKCD comic. Ah, oh, darn it. Come on, internet. Stop showing me Python and start showing me Python. I can't find it. Um, there's a specific, uh, uh, old blog article from Python 2 that I, I know I used, and it has a lot of uh, really great examples. I'll try and dig it up, and if I can, I'll put it onto Moodle. Cool. Well, if that's the case, I only got 40 more seconds, so have a good weekend. Take care. Take care.